Welcome. If everyone could, uh, come on in and get a seat if you can find one. Uh, we want to welcome you to, and I, I can't remember which, 25th, 24th uh, Veterans Day program. Uh, when my father started having a Veterans Day program and in memory of his father, who always celebrated Veterans Day by going out and firing a pistol in the air. Um, so this is probably the largest that we've had. And of course, this is the, the 99th anniversary of Armistice Day, as we now know as Veterans Day. So we want to welcome all of you here and welcome on, on behalf of the Tennessee Park Service. We'll hear from them here in a minute. And the Sergeant York Patriotic Foundation and the York family. Um, if we could, um, I know we have several members of the family here. Uh, I don't think Andrew has made it yet, but we have two of the two of the three living children of, uh, of my grandfather, Sergeant York. George Edward York, who is 94, Betsy Ross, who's 84, and Andrew should be here any minute, but uh, he doesn't like for me to give his age. <laughs> I know, <laughs> if you heard that, you know how old he is, and it wasn't me that said it, it was his sister that said he was 87, not me. <laughs> Andrew told me yesterday, he said, I may be, I may be 87, but I have the mind of a 30-year-old. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, could we have, I think we have, we have children, we have grandchildren, we have great-grandchildren, and I know we have at least one great, great grandchild here. Uh, could, all, could the family stand up? Thank you. And I think I'm right. I think that is, uh, I think that is the only great, great grandchild that's here. I, th there, I think there's other great, great grandchildren, but I think uh, Connor is the only one that's uh, here today. And of course, we're here to honor the veterans. Uh, Memorial Day, we honor those who gave their life for their country. On Veterans Day, we honor those who served, continue to serve, and, um, and Gave, gave for their country. Uh, Veterans Day was known as Armistice Day up until 1954. 1954, it became Veterans Day to honor all the, all the veterans. So we're glad to keep that tradition. We're glad that you all came out to celebrate Veterans Day with us. We wanna now recognize the special guests that we have, which are the veterans. What all World War II veterans stand up. Thank you. Do we have any Korea War veterans? Vietnam. Desert Storm. And the current conflict, which has, uh, I think, been longer than any uh, the current conflict we have in Afghanistan and Iraq and the war against terrorism. Would you stand? The last one we don't have as many here because a lot of them are still there. So, but anyway, we thank, uh, thank all of you for coming. We want to thank our veterans for uh, the service that they've given. And we appreciate all of you coming to honor the veterans. 
because that means a lot to the veterans. Um, okay, we will continue. We're going to uh, post the colors. Then if you would stand up for the posting of the colors, then we're going to do the National Pledge of Allegiance, National Anthem, and Invocation. If you can, uh, if you could just remain standing until after the invocation. Okay? Colors post. If you would, join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. the invocation. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion that brings us together to honor the veterans of our nation, all those who have fought in the wars of our country, that we might be free. We give you thanks for them and we honor them today. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy as Americans. We pray that we'll always be free, Lord. We thank you for the freedom we have in Christ, our Savior, who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, for all that you do for us. We pray you would bless this day, bless this program this morning, and all that we do. May your presence be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. And thank you for the invocation. That was uh, Reverend Sam Wood, pastor of the Pleasant View Nazarene Church and also a veteran of uh, the Iraq campaign. It's good to have him. And the significance of the, uh, of the national anthem, uh, Josh Wagner now will come and he will explain the significance of uh, the individual who played the trumpet for the national anthem. Josh Wagner, who's the ranger and manager of the park here. How are y'all doing today? So this day is about veterans, but there's a very special veteran that just played for us. Mr. Stuart Boone is a Battle of the Bulge veteran. 
He was with the 99th Division. When his unit was almost fully overrun, he was one of only 11 men that were not killed or captured. It is incredibly remarkable this gentleman is joining us today. And if you could please stand again and clap for him. It's through sacrifices like Mr. Boone made during the Second World War that we're able to be here today. And it's a great honor to be in front of you all. I'm very excited for the speakers that are following after me and all the rest of the programs we have going on here in a little bit. If you haven't taken an opportunity to go down to the trenches and see all the hard work our staff has put into this place, you really need to check it out. There's one other quick thing that I want to throw at you all. We're very, very excited, and this is a big announcement. We have now acquired the Yellow Doors, which is one of the iconic parts of Chardon York's story. It was up in Pickett State Forest. It is now going to be under the custody of Tennessee State Parks, and we will be leading a hike up there in the morning. If you're interested in that, go by the Visitor Center, and we'll get you some more details. Thank you again, guys. We wanted to thank the Color Guard also from uh, York Institute. Um, as you know, an uh, institute that my grandfather started back in the 20s, but uh, we were, we're glad to have them and honored to have them come and do the color guard for us today. Um, next is a welcome from my, my daughter, the executive director of the Sergeant York Patri Patriotic Foundation, Debbie York. to thank you all for being here. This is a special day for us. Like my dad said, my grandpa started this about 26 years ago, and it's wonderful to see so many faces here to say thank you to our veterans. Our veterans, we owe everything to our veterans. Their service and their sacrifice is why we're able to gather in places like this and say our pledge and sing. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the veterans and also to pause for a moment of silence as we reflect and pray for the men and women serving in harm's way today, and also all those we've lost in uniform this past year. Please join me in a moment of silence. Amen. One of my favorite parts about Veterans Day is seeing the youth. Passing on to the youth our ideals, our values, and our patriotism. And it's my honor to introduce the Noteworthy Choir. They're also from York Institute, and they're going to be singing some patriotic songs for us. Thank you again for being here, and let's give our veterans another round of applause.
You have just heard us sing My America, a song that uses classic words but still portrays a beautiful message. Our next song, Armed Forces Salute, is a melody of the anthems from the different military branches that serve this country selflessly. When you hear your branch, please stand or raise your hand to be recognized. special guest up here on the stage with us as well as all of you in the audience and I wanted to take a few minutes to recognize a few of them and let them say a few words to you the first is Terry Hamby he is actually the newly elected chairman of the National World War One Commission and we're honored that he's able to be with us for his first visit to the Sergeant York home site and he happens to be here today so thank you Terry for being here Ah, thank you. It, it's great uh, to be here at the home place of one of America's finest soldiers. And uh, 
you know, Sergeant Albert New York is what the Army's all about. It's, uh, and America's all about. It's uh, a young farm boy who was unassumingly going of, about his life when a tragedy broke out and uh, he left his home to go to a place that he didn't think he would ever visit, fight in a war that he didn't start, and was willing to die for liberty and peace for people that he'd never met. That's the definition of an American soldier. That's the definition of an American veteran who in a country where we have less than one half of one percent who serves their country, it's fitting that we come to a place like this where tradition and heroism and peace and liberty are what we care most about in our country. Americans have always cherished peace and liberty and uh, it, it's so wonderful to be here today and be inspired. When I come to Veterans Day, I promise myself that I will always see the faces of my friends, like I know all of you have, of friends and neighbors who gave their ultimate sacrifice so that we may gather in a place like this today. Uh, I'm, I share, I'm on the World War I Centennial Commission. Our responsibility, of which we, I feel both humbled and honored, is to erect a memorial in Washington, D.C. to the men, to Sergeant York's brethren who fought a hundred years ago to bring peace to the world. And I am humble as I study about those men that left their homes and went to fight for liberty and peace. We broke ground on the memorial in D.C. last Thursday. It's not D.C.'s memorial. It just so happens to be located there because it's fitting that the nation recognize after 100 years the sacrifices and the service of those men who left their homes to go defend liberty and peace for us. And it's an honor. <laughs> and it's, it will be done <laughs> before the sunset of this commission, which is 2019. It's, uh, we, uh, those of us that are responsible for doing it with the help of all of you, uh, we will not sleep until that memorial is built. And before, as I leave and close, as a Vietnam veteran, and, and I didn't get it wrong, I was in the Navy for four, over four years, and then I joined the Army and spent another 22 years in that. So I had the opportunity to serve in two different military uh, organizations, and it was the most honorable thing I've ever done and ever will do. But I would like to close with what's always inspired me as a Vietnam veteran. There was a Canadian major, John McRae, who at the occasion of conducting a funeral for one of the officers in his command, he, with I'm sure full of emotion, penned a poem called On Flanders Field. And that last verse has always served as my inspiration to always honor the men and women who served and that last verse is like 
McRae was speaking for all of the men and women who, fall, who have fallen in our country. And it, it says, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, with failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. For if you give up the faith for those of us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow and Flanders fill. Thursday, the nation, as we broke ground in Pershing Park, the nation started that process of keeping the faith with our World War I veterans. Thank you so much for being here. The next guest I would like to honor is one of our own partners. Um, the Sergeant York Patriotic Foundation could not do what we do without our partnership with Tennessee State Parks. We've worked really well together, and what you see today is because of this collaboration and this teamwork. And one of the heads of that team is Mr. Jeff Wells, Director of Interpretive Programming. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and once again, it's an honor to be able to stand before you and, and, and talk a little bit with you this, this morning. I would like to echo uh, Josh's comments on Mr. Boone. Now, I met Mr. Boone last night for the first time. It was a little chilly in here, but he was sitting right up here under this heater. He had his horn on his lap, just like he does this morning, and if you could name off a song, he can play it. <laughs> but what a fine gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Uh, at Tennessee State Parks, our job is to preserve and protect. We preserve and protect the natural landscapes of Tennessee, the beauty of our great state. We preserve the cultural stories, and we preserve individual stories. And there's no greater story of a native son than that of Sergeant Alvin C. York. It's a story of sacrifice, of conflict. It's a, a story of um, heroism. And ultimately, it's a story of education. It's a fascinating story, and it's our job at Tennessee State Parks to keep that story alive and keep all the stories alive. So out here with Mr. Wagner and his staff at, at this particular park, we have 55 other parks across the state that are doing the same thing, different stories, but also we are working to keep these stories alive. It's a privilege to be able to do so. I thank you for that privilege. I've had the opportunity to work for you, the people of Tennessee, for the last 37 years. I thank you for that. So this morning, after we conclude, or this afternoon, I would encourage you to get out and, and mix with our park staff and, and hear what they have to say. But to the York family, thank you so much for allowing us to be a partner with you. For the Great War Commission and the Tennessee Great War Commission, thanks to everyone. So thank you very much. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge one that's hiding incognito in the back. Um, Deputy Commissioner Brock Hill, who has made all this partnership happen, he's hiding back there in the back, but he would love to meet you later. Um, thank you for your hard work, Brock. The next guest that I'd like to welcome, yes, thank you. And a few of our representatives and senators were not able to be here with us today. We have Senator Yeager, Representative Kiesling, who actually worked to pass a special legislative bill so that we could have funding for programs like this. They, they've helped us with World War I Centennial Programming, so if you see Senator Yeager or Representative Kiesling, please say thank you because they wholeheartedly support our veterans and they support this park and what we're doing to honor World War I. Our next guest that I would like to welcome is Randy Boyd. I've had the honor to meet and work with Randy Boyd these last few months, and I have to tell you, he's a man that puts his actions where his words go, and he really honors veterans. He was the former Commissioner of Economic and Community Development. He's a current candidate for Governor of Tennessee, and he's actually the mastermind behind the Tennessee Promise and the Drive to 55, and he's just recently started a Veterans Coalition to learn more about veterans' needs across the state of Tennessee. So we're honored to welcome Randy Boyd. Thank, 
thank you, and, and I'm honored to be here. I'm also honored to say that uh, Debbie York is our honorary chair of that Veterans Coalition, so I'm looking forward to the, the year ahead and learning more from her. Um, so when I sat down, I sat by uh, Josh Wagoner, and I, he, he apologized, and he said, well, I want you to know that I've been in the trenches all day, and I might smell a little bit, so you kind of drew the short straw sitting by me. And then I made a dumb, I, I asked a dumb question. I said, well, are we winning? And he said, we always win. <laughs> so, I just want to say a few brief thank yous. First, thank you to all of our veterans who served. Second, only to God, I owe my life to our veterans. And I think that's true for all of us. I also want to thank all of our veterans for everything they do after they've served in the service. I think of all the veterans that I've come in contact with throughout my life that are serving their families, that are serving their churches, that are serving their communities, that are serving their businesses, and the difference they make after their service in the armed services. And I thank you for, for that contribution. And then lastly, I want to thank all the families that make the sacrifices with the, those loved ones when they go off to serve. The families give up so much and make such a sacrifice. So I think we should always think about them on Veterans Day as well. And uh, lastly, I want to thank the York family. Before I do, I did have the opportunity for just a moment to talk to a couple of the, the color guard when I walked in, a couple of the young men. And I'm hopeful to have a new job in about a year. And so I asked them, if I have to have this new job and you get any wish, what would it be? And one young man, both at the, going to the York Institute, one said, well, I wish we had a bigger, stronger ROTC program. And it seems like if you're going to have the best ROTC program in a high school in the country, why not be here at the York Institute in Fentress County? We should try to make that happen. <laughs> and, and then the, the other young man said, well, my wish is, I wish that we could fix up the old York Institute and turn it into something special. I said, well, conveniently enough, the first time I met Debbie York and her family, that was their wish too, and that's their dream. If those that don't know it, but their dream is to turn that a facility into a place that they're calling the Center for Peace and Valor. Now, everybody that knows Sergeant York's story knows that that was him. That was his life. He was a man uh, dedicated to peace, but when called to action, he was swift and sure, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, warrior our country has ever produced. Um, this center will be there to represent both those two things. And if you think about America, I think that's America, a place that is dedicated to peace, but when called to action, we are swift and sure. And we always win. So I hope one day, thank you. I hope one day to soon be working with Debbie and her family to make that dream come true. Well, thank you again for letting me be here. God bless our veterans. God bless America. We are honored today to have Colonel Doug Mastriano as our guest speaker. Uh, we first met, I guess I was a uh, I guess I was a lieutenant colonel or a colonel at the time, and my son was on active duty, and we got a phone call from, uh, from a, a common acquaintance and uh, got me in touch with Doug and said, uh, would you be available to come up to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California? Anyone who's ever been to Monterey, California knows that if you get an invitation to go to Monterey, California, you go. It's a beautiful place for those of you who have been there. So we talked, and I said, sure. And I said, my son is actually going to be here, who is also on active duty. So my son and I went to Monterey, and uh, then Captain Mastriano uh, held a, a small ceremony and dedicated one of their language labs to my grandfather. During that conversation, he was telling me how he had always been a fan loved the story, had seen the movie, had read whatever books, and uh, that that was one of his heroes. Uh, we stayed in touch after that. Uh, he obviously got promoted uh, to major lieutenant colonel and then colonel. And uh, we also met his son. We, he invited us to the 90th anniversary 
of the action at, uh, in France. And we went, my daughter, my dad and I went, and they had a fantastic ceremony. And at that point we met uh, his wife and his son, Josh, who cannot be with us today. But Josh was working on his Eagle Scout program. And so he finished the trail, the Sergeant York Trail in Chatel Shahiri, France. Uh, a nice monument there. And uh, later we saw him again uh, at, well, twice, once at Fort McNair when he brought some artifacts and gave to, to the Army Museum. And another one when his son actually made Eagle Scout. My father and I went to Pennsylvania and attended the ceremony where uh, Josh was pinned as an, as an Eagle Scout. So if you've seen the paper, you've seen his bio, uh, it's about 15 pages long. Uh, he's done amazing work. He has been uh, with NATO. He's also been, uh, I think, three times in Afghanistan or more. Three, three's enough. Uh, three times in Afghanistan. Uh, his last assignment was at the War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. And um, we're honored to have him with us. Uh, he has a distinguished career. Uh, again, uh, he has a master's degree. He has a PhD. Uh, he has worked tire tirelessly uh, throughout his career. He's had some great assignments. He's done some great things for the nation. And it's my honor to welcome him to Pall Mall, Tennessee and to our Veterans Day program. Uh, he also has written a book on my grandfather uh, that was very comprehensive, uh, one of the best books that we've seen because he was able in his time with NATO in Europe to go into the German archives and get some of their from get the the battle from the Germans point of view and so uh, we want to welcome him so if you would give him a nice Tennessee welcome to uh, Pal Mau. Wow it is an honor to be here with you guys and uh, for me, this is a, a highlight of my life, actually, because obviously I, I hold the, the Sergeant York story in high esteem. So thank you, Deb and Gerald, for having me here. You know, uh, th these are often dark times for our country, and I hope through my couple minutes of remarks, not going to be very long, but to give everybody here hope on how you can make a difference and change the course of history. You'll often hear me say to people that I meet, uh, what you do in life matters. What you do in life matters. It echoes across the generations and into eternity. You can make a difference. And I'm going to hit a few highlights on how I can prove that to you. You know, on this day, 99 years ago, 99 years ago today was the end of the, the first great war. It was a terrible calamity. We don't, we're not even sure of the casualties, but it looks like around 12 million uh, military-related, and then up to another 100 million casualties with the Spanish flu that broke out from the war. It was a calamity that shook the world. The last 11 hours of the war, the war ended at 11 o'clock, so on the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour, the war ended. And in those short few hours on the 11th of November, the Allies suffered 11,000 casualties, just shy of that, of which were more than 3,000 Americans. The Germans were not ready to quit. The last to fall on that fateful day was a private Henry Gunter, a banker from Baltimore, Maryland, and he was shot at 10.59, and the soldiers alongside him said literally he was falling to the ground to his death as the war ended, and then when his body hit the ground, he was charging a German machine gun position, there was silence on the battlefield. It was an eerie silence. And it's people like Henry Gunther that I hope that will reflect upon. Great sacrifice has been given by millions of men and women over the millennia to save this, to protect this nation over the past several hundred years. And uh, it seems like we've lost our country. The shooting last week in Texas, a church, that murder or killing women, children, and men in cold blood in, in a house of worship shows you that our country, we need modern day Henry Gunther's and we need modern day Alvin York's. You know, uh, in 1917 and 1918, millions of men 
uh, answered the call. And for, in fact, we're going to go from 200,000 soldiers in 1917 to 4 million by 1918. And one of those soldiers was this guy called James Rieger. James Rieger was a lawyer from Kirksville, Missouri. Okay, he joined the Army. Since he graduated from college, they made him an officer, but he didn't know what he was doing. He reported for duty with the 35th Division. And while he was at camp with the men training in the States, preparing to ship off to France, he realized that there was not a lot for the soldiers to do other than go downtown and get drunk. So he started a Sunday school program that attracted several hundred soldiers every week. And they got introduced to the Bible and to Jesus, and uh, it was good. Except had James Gunther's, I'm um, sorry, James Rieger's boss, his name was General Barry, did not like that. He thought this practicing Christian in uniform was a weak man. He was weak, and I'm going to get him kicked out of the army. General Barry tried all he could to fire Major Rieger for doing the right thing. But, the, but thankfully, the army said, no, he stays in. Okay, now we're in France. The Meuse-Argonne campaign, 99 years ago, is going on. And Major Rieger's in charge of liberating Vaqua Hill. He's, he commands a battalion of soldiers. He's the first Allied soldier to cross Vaqua Hill. This is the same hill that over the last four years the French and Germans cannot, cannot secure. The hill is missing a centerpiece of it from being blown up from, from uh, underground tunnels and mines. Okay, that's interesting. So Rieger liberated Vaqua Hill, and then he goes on to be the first American to liberate two more French villages. You know what's interesting to me is why should you care about this? M General Barry said to Major Rieger, you're altogether worthless. You'll never accomplish anything. Look what this guy did. He, he was called by the French the hero of the Argonne. This, this lawyer with no military experience from nowhere, Missouri, and look what he did. On, as a side note, what happened to General Barry? At the same time that this altogether worthless soldier is freeing French, French villages and, and, and securing French territory, uh, General Barry is fired for incompetence. Interesting. You can get justice in his life. <laughs> At least he did. All right. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, God uses the foolish. God uses the foolish to confound the weak. I'm sorry, to confound the... The wise, so let me say again, 1 Corinthians 1.27, God uses the foolish to confound the wise and the weak to confound the strong. This should give everybody hope here. Because just around the corner from us is a, is a sacred place, the Sergeant York House, and he grew up in this valley. And you guys know the story probably better than I do. But what's interesting to me is that he was considered, Alvin York as a young man was considered by many to be foolish and weak. Foolish because he only had basically a third grade education, but weak because after his, his dad, William, died in 1911, York was responsible for running the household because his two older brothers were already gone, and Alvin could not handle the pressure. And so he turned to booze just down the road in, in Bald Rock and in Static. He started getting drunk with those blind tigers, chasing girls, cussing, gambling, and it was not good. And those were rough places. Those blind tigers, you didn't go to watch a soccer game on a big screen TV. You went there to get in trouble and to get drunk. And in fact, in one of the places that he hung out at, it was called the Huddleston's Place. And in Huddleston's Place, 25 people died, were, were murdered in bar fights while he was there. So you can imagine that Alvin's mom, Mary, was quite worried about her son, that he's going to die. And obviously, she's disappointed because he rejected his Christian upbringing. But thank God, a beautiful young lady named Gracie caught his eye, and he started going to church because her dad, Francis Asbury, said, there's no way that you're going to date my daughter because you're a backslider. And anyway, Alvin started going to church, and there was a revival meeting on 1 January 1915, and he heard the gospel message, and he said, it was like lightning hit my soul. And when an altar call was given by Reverend Russell, Alvin York could not be stopped. And he went up to the altar, accepted the Lord, and his life changed. And you'll hear more about this this afternoon. But this is somebody that the world viewed as hopelessly lost, somebody he'd never make a difference. And look what God did with a life. As you know the story, Alvin York's going to find himself in the Argonne Forest in 1918, faced by German machine guns, overwhelming odds, all hope is lost for the 82nd Division. But Alvin York and 16 other soldiers break through enemy lines and change the course of history. Who says that a good-for-nothing drunk can't amount for anything, especially after God gets a hold of their life. What you do in life matters. It's true. You know, when I joined the Army more than 30 years ago, one of my, my civilian boss told me I'd never make it. Yeah, she told me that. And I was like, well, that's really encouraging. Thank you very much. But, you know, I thought a bit more on that recently since... Sadly, a week and a half ago, I retired. But anyway, 
you know what? She's right. I could not have made it without God, without Jesus in my heart. Just like how Alvin York could not have done what he did without Jesus. And just like Major Rieger, that altogether worthless soldier that, that, that General Barry tried to fire, look what he could do with the Lord in his heart. When you have, I'm going to paraphrase from Alvin York, when you have God on your side, you come out on top every time. That's a fact. Well, let me give you another vignette here. I'm going to wrap it up. There is a situation in, in July 1863. The United States is in the midst of a bloody civil war, and it looks like the United States is going to be split down the middle. The Yankees, they keep on losing. Confederates are now storming against Gettysburg on this hill called Little Round Top. Defending the base of Little Round Top is this insecure man from Maine, from Brewer, Maine. His name is Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He's been in charge of the regiment, the 20th Maine, for one month. And what's interesting, about we see the movie, and the movie is great, and it's accurate, and, but you know what? Almost all his life, he had a severe stuttering problem. He was laughed at and mocked because he couldn't talk right. Even in college, he had a stuttering problem. They called it stammering back then. And all, he was raised in a Christian home. He loved the Lord, and he's praying all his life, God, please deliver me from this. And it's, it made him insecure. He felt stupid. He was mocked and laughed at, especially as a young man. So be, he became a severe introvert because if you say anything, you're going to stutter because he's afraid he's going to stutter. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But now we find a stuttering fool from Maine controlling the fate of this nation and world history on that one day on 2nd July, 1863. And we all know the rest of the story. This, this kid, this stuttering fool from Maine, he defended that line, and when his man, men ran out of ammunition, they, he ordered a bayonet attack, and he changed the course of history. So anyone here, if you were growing up, if, if God forbid even your mom or dad, when you are being raised, said you'll never amount to anything, don't believe that lie, because Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain heard that lie. Jim Rieger from Missouri heard that lie. Alvin York heard that lie when he's in the middle of his struggles with alcohol and backsliding, and look what God did with the life. So we're looking at men and women today to rise up to save this nation. All right, I'm going to wrap this up here. You know, th these are often dark days for our country. And it's heartbreaking to me, after 30 years of service, I'm giving the country to my son, uh, less secure, less prosperous, but th there's hope there, but less secure, less moral, less good, We've, we've seemed to lost our way. My, my dad gave me my, my country in, in the 1980s, I think, in pretty good shape. And something's gone wrong. It's, it's, it's us. I, I think we've, my generation, we stumbled and dropped that torch. And I'd say it's time for us to pick that back up and hand it back to the next generation behind us. This country is worth fighting for, and I'm not going to give it up. I'm going to ask everyone in here, whether you're a stuttering fool from Maine, or a dumb kid from a public school in New Jersey like me, I think we, God can use us to change the course of history, just like he had with Rieger, Chamberlain, and York. You know? Yeah. It only takes one man or woman to change the course of history. And how, how exactly can we be prepared for that day? There might be a day when one of you are called to, to face, I hope not, face a gunman in the church or somewhere else or to face some kind of left-wing lunatic imposing an atheist, atheistic ideology upon us that, that's ruining our country. And how can you be prepared for that day? And Alvin York, he knew. Alvin said about his temptations and trials after he became a Christian, it was hard to turn his back on alcohol. But looking back on, on his life, Alvin York said, all the temptations I'd done went through were to build my character. So every day when Alvin York tried to, to do the right thing, to serve the Lord, and not to give in to temptation or sin, he became a moral and courageous, brave man in his heart. This, that's how you prepare yourself for that day. Because nobody suddenly becomes a hero in the heat of battle or in the heat of a crisis. By walking every day to do, and choosing to do the right thing, you could change the course of history. Here's what Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain said. That's, that stuttering fool from Maine who saved this nation on 2nd July, 1863 at Gettysburg. This is what Chamberlain says about building your character muscle. That's what I call it, building your character muscle. We know not of the future and cannot plan for it much. Yeah, he's right. It's, you can't predict the future. But you can hold your spirits and bodies so pure and high. You may cherish such thoughts and such ideals and dream such dreams of lofty purpose. Why should I strive for those noble things? 
so that you can know and determine what manner of man or woman you will be whenever and wherever that hour strikes that calls you to noble action. This predestination God has given each of us because no man or woman becomes different than their established habit or practice. That's how we can change the course of history. You know, in John chapter 15, Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did that for us. And in a small way, by being bold and courageous today in this nation, in these days when we have the enemies of our countries trying to change this country and turn it on its head, trying to make what's evil good and what's good evil, we can make a difference. And I'm asking everyone here to rise up to make a difference because our time has come. I see a lot of young people in here, and God forbid that I hand my country over to you in the, sh in the bad shape that looks like it's headed in. And I'm going to do all I can to prevent that from happening. And I'm asking everyone here to rise up to make the same difference. You know, I'm thinking once again about the sacrifices and heroism of the million of millions of Americans who fought across the, the millennia for this country. And for their sake and also for the young people's sakes, we've got to do our bit. It's now our time. So I'm going to ask everyone here to say no to the darkness, to say no to the oppression, and then to give us a, and, and pray to God that he gives us the strength, the courage, the wisdom, the discernment to, to change the course of history just like Rieger did, that altogether worthless soldier, just like York did, that good and for nothing drunk, just like Chamberlain did, that stuttering fool from Maine. And you know what? When you yield yourself to God's will, you can and will change the course of history. May God bless each of you and this country and our veterans. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can see why we're honored to have uh, Doug with us today. A, a super officer, a super military guy, and a super human being and a great Christian. Thank you. Uh, before Deb jumps up here and knocks me off the stage, I just wanted to say thanks to Terry Hamby and his wife for joining us today. Um, I had a chance to meet them in Chicago last week, and it was very, very nice. Uh, we had a very good conversation. And during that, Terry said he normally does, when, like when I had the veterans stand up, he always uh, does that and then says, will all the World War I veterans stand up? And there's none. And that's the reason the Great War Commission is, was formed to speak for those veterans that can't speak for themselves because there are no living World War I veterans anymore. So we thank you for all your efforts and Carolyn for you to be here.
You just heard us sing This Is My Country, a song that talks about that it doesn't matter where you're from inside America, or if it was your choice to be in the States. It is a country to be proud of. Our next song, featuring Noteworthy, talks about letting freedom ring across the land. Please listen as Noteworthy sings Let Freedom Ring.
you so much. That was wonderful, Stuart. And thank you, Noteworthy and Advanced Choir from York. You always are the highlight of this program. I wanted to say a few words in closing. I am very proud to live in a county where this many people stop our busy lives and come out to say thank you to our veterans. It warms my heart to see all your smiling faces and to see all the veterans that are here. If we could give our veterans one more round of applause. It has been a few, a rough few months, I believe, for America. And I think that there's more darkness highlighted than light. And this quote struck me from a book called Love Does, and I think it's very fitting for today. It says, gratitude isn't just a bowed head at dinner, thanking God for providing the food. It is expressing love to people who grew it. It is not just sentimental sigh when we salute our flag. It's remembering the sacrifice and commitment of others who gave up their lives so we could live ours. People who have been touched by kindness of others don't hold on to this love, waiting to be grateful. They give that love away knowing freely gratefulness will find them. We've all experienced pain and loss. Pain isn't graded on a curve. Whatever form it comes in, it just hurts. It will either take us out or lead us forward. Let gratefulness be your trusted guide. Follow its footsteps, and it will lead each of us to kindness, patience, and wisdom. It will also lead us back to each other. It takes a lot to be grateful if your world has been filled with hurt. Gratefulness doesn't skip over the most difficult times of our lives as if they didn't occur. Instead, it reminds us of who we are despite those difficult times. I thank God with a grateful heart for each and every one of you here today. And I believe that everyone here today has a contribution to make to our wonderful country. And I wanna thank those who are serving in harm's way today and those of you who have proudly worn the uniform in the past. I really believe Sergeant York is smiling down from heaven at all of the love and peace and gratitude we've expressed here today. And I believe we can add much more of this needed kindness into our world as we build the Sergeant York Center for Peace and Valor in his historic school where the children still go today to high school. We need your help, so please stop by the patriotic booth that's out front to learn more. And I just want to say God bless each and every one of you on this special Veterans Day. We will conclude our ceremony with a singing. Everybody will be join us in singing God Bless America. And then we have the, the whole York DAV that will be outside doing 21 Gun Salute and Cheryl Crabtree will play taps. And I want all of our veterans to stay for a veteran's picture right out front of the barn. Again, with a grateful heart, I say thank you for being here. I want to thank the reenactors, the pilots. This program has hundreds of people behind it. And I couldn't mention everybody, but I want to thank everyone that's here on the stage. I want to thank all of our veterans and thank each and every one of you. With a grateful heart, I say God bless America and thank you for being here. Let's all stand and sing God bless America as we conclude our program today. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountain to the prairie. To the oceans, white with gold. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet.
My name is Debbie York and we're honored to welcome you to the Sergeant York Park today. Today is Veterans Day and we have two very special guests with us. We actually have a meeting of two generations of a story that are tied together within World War II. Kay showed up to meet Mr. Boone who, sh who was in World War II and he was only one of 11 survivors with his unit and they were called the Lucky 11 and it was in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. So we've got Kay whose father is actually tied to this story in a magnificent way. Yes, I was Kay Little and my father, Joseph Morris Little, was in World War II at the Battle of the Bulge. And I read with interest when I saw that Mr. Boone was going to be here. So I called my brother and I said, what unit was Daddy in? And he said he was in General Patton's 3rd Army and he rescued or helped rescue Mr. Boone and the Eleven. And that just intrigued me, and I had to come and meet Mr. Boone. But the story goes, they had to march two days and two nights in the mud to get to this group to rescue them. And uh, the upper people, upper crust, told General Patton, you will never be able to do it to rescue these men. And said General Patton said, yes, we can, because I trained them and they did reach them and save them and it, it just is so special to me i'm sorry to meet this man that my daddy helped rescue and he's still surviving daddy's looking down on us with uh, i'm sure a lot more people but it's such a an honor to get to meet him because he was he was in the same place where my daddy was thank you for your service thank you. And how does it feel to meet the daughter of one of the men that really, saved you? That's, that's great. Uh, uh, we had uh, 20,000 men in our division, but after the invasion surprise attack by the Germans on the 16th and 17th of December 1944, why, uh, we just had to... Uh, we were the people that were there to do what we had to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, and you did it with honor. Thank you. you you served all of the men. My daddy wouldn't talk about it much, but all of the men uh, served with honor and knew it was their duty for their country, and they they did it proudly. Thank and thank you. And this is one of the many stories that comes out of Veterans Day, and we're honored to honor our veterans on this day and every day to say thank you for your service and your sacrifice and all of the heroes of all of the American conflicts and wars and peacetime service of all of our veterans. I'm Stuart Boone. I originally lived in Kansas. I've come to this area to uh, live closer to my daughter, and a son-in-law. So uh, the story about my starting on the trumpet, which I've played plenty of here at the Alvin Dork uh, reunion memorial. And uh, the way I got started was my dad ran a Standard Oil filling station. In those days, uh, cars would pull in the station drive and you'd run out and, and check their oil and and filled our gas tank, had to hand pump the gas tank up, uh, the gasoline up into the uh, calibrated globe which held 10 gallons. But anyway, when I got my dad, I'd go over and help him quite often at the filling station. And um, he would keep a tab on his good customers and they'd come and pay once a month. On, on one occasion, one of those uh, people that he'd charged a, a purchases to uh, came uh, to him and said to my dad, Mr. Boone, I cannot pay my bill this month, but I have this trumpet I've brought. Would you take it in on what I owe you? And so my dad was quite thrilled to get it, and he gave the man credit for the paying his bill, and to me, he came at home and said, here boy, learn to play this. Well, it was tough in those days because we didn't have a high school band. Uh, the only music teacher I had was a fourth grade uh, teacher that came uh, 
one hour a week and and we learned a little bit of music in the process. Well, anyway, when I was nine years old and in fourth grade, well, I got this trumpet from this man who owed my dad for his gasoline. And that trumpet uh, was what I played for about four years till I was a sophomore in high school. And, and we, as a family, rounded up the $120 to make the purchase of a, a Liberty model a trumpet manufactured in in Ohio at, uh, well, I guess in Indiana. Anyway, uh, to, to get a trumpet under those circumstances, why well, I never did feel like I could put it in the closet after school or, or any time, I just, felt obligated to continue to play as long as I could. Well, I have. I've played for, for some big audiences and for small groups. And here at the Alvin Dark Memorial Service, while well, we've uh, played a lot of music over at the York residence and home and uh, continue to have interest in playing for the groups here, played the national anthem here at the at the Dork uh, Memorial Service. And so um, I just, well, it's my horn has taken me everywhere to college on a scholarship, playing, uh, I never did play in a dance band except while we was in, while I was in school and uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, taking some military courses. And uh, that was the, the only time that we, I played just a little while with a dance group. It was a co-ed college, and they insisted that there be some army musicians who could play some dance music for them. Anyway, uh, I've enjoyed uh, being, I was wanting to be a, a uh, high school band leader, but when I learned how many years that took and and uh, how difficult it was to get that kind of a degree, well, I just decided I can't uh, do all of that. So I changed my college uh, degree to business administration. And so I've followed that career and held a number of jobs leading up, but I always, uh, have had my trumpet close by to utilize whenever opportunity presents itself. Welcome, and uh, as I said before, Colonel Mastriano, we're honored to have him here as our guest speaker, and he also agreed to go over uh, for about 30 or 40 minutes uh, a couple of books that he's written, and to kind of give you a background on the, on the battle in the Argonne Forest. And uh, we're honored to have him. As I said earlier, we met when he was a captain, uh, dedicated a language lab to my grandfather, Sergeant York, out at Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. He's followed uh, my grandfather for years and uh, has been one of his heroes. His son got his Eagle Scout uh, award by uh, doing a trail up at the uh, Sergeant York in France, Chatel Shahiri and the Sergeant York Trail. But without any further ado, great soldier, great man, and a good Christian man that has a great vision for the future for our country, Doug Mastriano. Wow, thank you for being here. Gerald, thank you for that introduction. That is outstanding. What, what an honor to be here. I'm obviously quite thrilled, because you'd never guess that uh, Alvin York is one of my great heroes, huh? But you, you couldn't tell that. You know, what you do in life matters. I spoke about this at 11 o'clock. What you do in life matters. It echoes across the generations and into eternity. I'm going to talk about the York story here, but it's more than just going over a past life you know, a giant who's gone before us. I'm gonna lay out the story to you in the end here and why you should care, how it matters, and how you too can make a difference in the course of history. All right, so a life that matters. His life mattered, 
and your life matters too. So let's get into this. You know, my odyssey with Alvin York began when I was about 10 years old. In the early 70s, uh, there was a war movie coming on the old black and white TV. And my dad said, hey, you ought to check this movie out with Gary Cooper in it. I'm like, okay, it's a war movie. And the Sergeant York story, as indicated in the movie, captivated me. He was no John Wayne. He didn't want to go to war. He didn't want to fight the enemy. I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? Didn't want to be a hero. Didn't want to make money off of his heroism. It really bothered me. And so that's always in the back of my mind. Fast forward to uh, now I'm an officer in the, in the 80s, and I'm intrigued by the York story. The United States Army, even today, holds up York in our leadership manuals as how we want our soldiers to be. We want our soldiers to be like Chamberlain at Little Round Top Gettysburg and but like Alvin York. I was like, well, this is great. And then I start doing research and there's these big old fat arrows on small maps on where it happened. To make matters worse, my wife and I, we lived about 10 years in Europe and so we got to spend a lot of time looking for the York spot and even the French people in the village like, it's out there somewhere, you know, a mile or so out in the forest. It's like, what? That's unsatisfactory. To make matters worse, modern day Americans, we tend to be cynical and sarcastic people. It, it's sad, but we like to become cynical and sarcastic, and we're really good at character assassination of heroes. I was uh, teaching a seminar at the War College, and one of, the, one of the soldiers in my class was a Filipino colonel. So I was obviously using G General Douglas MacArthur as one of our, our heroes to talk about since MacArthur liberated Japan, I'm um, sorry, Philippines in 1944. And as I'm talking about MacArthur, several of the American officers in my seminar room started snickering and laughing. Oh, MacArthur was such an egomaniac and started listing all his flaws. I was just stupefied. I didn't know what to say. But the Filipino colonel was mad and he stood up and said, I don't know what's wrong with you Americans, but he's a hero to my country and he's a hero to me, so stop it. And I was like, wow. That's the condition we're in. We, you know, all of us have flaws. We're, we're all imperfect men and women. We know that. We all have sins in our lives. And I would say, let's look for the good we can pull from people's lives. Now, I've dived deep in New York story. You know what his flaw was that I could find? He was too generous. If you needed something, he'd give you the shirt off his back. And that's quite a testimony to the York family. What a legacy to leave behind. I've, I've spent more than a decade looking into the life and legacy of uh, Alvin York and he was the real deal. And let's talk about his life now. So of course, here we are. What a great place to be. It, this is where it all happened in this area here. The third of 11 kids and raised in a good Christian family. Things are fantastic. As many of us have been blessed to be raised in a Christian family that, that loves the Lord. But things went wrong in 1911. While uh, shoeing a mule in the blacksmith shop, uh, William York, York's dad, was kicked in the chest, and he's going to die from complications from that injury. What do you do? Alvin's two older brothers are gone, so he's, he's the oldest boy at home. Now he's in charge of running the farm, taking care of mom, and taking, putting meat on the table for the kids. That's a lot for a young man that to take care of. Go from the basically the looked over middle child to now you're the man of the house. Wow. To make matters worse, you know the story about the farmland, you know, scratch farming from rocks and just bad. It's just hard to get good crop out of the, the, the hillside uh, farmland they had originally. And so the pressure was too much for York. So York, uh, to blow off steam, he started going down the road to, uh, to Bald Rock and, and down to uh, Static, to the Blind Tigers, those, those drinking establishments, those bars on the border of Tennessee, Kentucky and uh, they try to blow off some steam. And, and Alvin said at first it was, I just went down to have fun and hang out, then started gambling a little bit, and before you know it, I'm just taking a little bit of the whiskey and then cussing a little bit, and he slowly, it's, it's, it's very sneaky how sin catches up on you and pulls you down. At first it's innocent, and before you know it, he's spending, Alvin is spending his weekends up in the Blind Tigers or in the farms nearby with whiskey, spending it drunk. His favorite game that time was Last Man Standing. You guys know that game, right? Him and his friends, uh, Everett Delk and uh, Marion Lafew and, and a couple of his brothers would go to the Blind Tigers, spend all the money that they could on the booze and then keep drinking. And the last guy not passed out gets to keep the rest of the booze. I mean, that, that's quite a way to spend your weekends. Obviously, his mom, Mary, was really concerned about this because what happened to my son? I raised him to be a Christian. His dad, William, was a great Christian man. He was called Judge York. He was such an honest man that when neighbors had a, d a dispute, he was asked to resolve it, even if the dispute was with him. 
He was so honest. He, if, if it hurt him, he'd decide against himself. And so with that legacy, Alvin York's life is you're, you're nothing like your dad. Now his mom would spend the weekends up worried death about him, worried to death about him, not to yell and carry on, but, but to basically make sure he comes home alive because the Huddleston's blind tiger down the road here, about 25 people died in one year in gunfights and knife fights, you know, a bunch of drunk, angry young guys, you know, fighting over the, the one girl that shows up or whatever. And so it's, it, it's a rough place and she's really worried and she's praying for him and he's just not coming around. But thankfully, uh, young Gracie Williams shows up and Alvin wants to date and see Gracie, but Gracie's dad, Francis Asbury Williams, of course, is like, you're not gonna date my daughter. I don't think any father or mother in this room would allow someone like Alvin York at that time in his life to, to date their daughter. And so the only way Alvin York could see Gracie Williams is to go to church. So he starts attending a church just to see Gracie. You know, and you guys know the story of the church down here, you, the, the ladies sit on the right side and the men sit on the left side when you, when you go in back in those days. And he tried to sit in a spot on the left side where he could kind of keep his eyes on Gracie. And so he's going there and it, his mom is hopeful but you know, he's not there for the gospel. But good news comes in because they got a foreigner coming in from Indiana. This guy, Reverend Russell, is a saddlebag preacher. You know, they call saddlebag preachers because they ride in on the mules with saddlebags full of Bibles and hymnals and tracts. And so Reverend Russell comes and he's gonna preach a, a revival week going up until New Year's Day, 1 January 1915. York's like, this is out. Alvin York is like, this is outstanding because I get to see Gracie every day. It's not just seeing her in church, but he tries to walk home with the Williams family as well to talk to her. It's a bit awkward at times when Francis Asbury William kind of you know, interrupts them, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. So anyway, Alvin starts going to these weekly meetings and Francis, uh, I'm sorry, Reverend Russell's preaching is, is straight from the word of God. It's uh, right out of uh, Romans chapter three. You know, the bad news is you're a sinner going to hell, but the good news is Jesus can save you. And so York, Alvin York is going to these meetings and it's really bothering him. It's starting to click. And he, he's going up to his, his spot up there to think and, and, and pray up on the mountain behind us here. And I was excited to hear that, that that property now belongs to you guys. That's outstanding. Wow, that's an important place to the whole York legacy. He spent a lot of time talking to the Lord up there. So anyway, Alvin's up there with his hounds in between hunting, and he's praying, and he finally goes on the 1st of January, 1915, back to the revival service, and that's the moment where he said, it's like lightning hit my soul. When, a, when Reverend Russell's preaching the gospel, York's like, okay, I need to get saved. And he goes up there, and one of uh, Alvin's uh, neighbors, I think it was Roy Williams, who, who hired, had hired out York a few, for a few jobs and was friends with uh, Alvin's dad, before he passed away, and he'd been praying for Alvin. When York got up to go to the altar, Mr. Williams put his arm around Alvin. They walked up together, side by side, and, and Alvin prayed and accepted the Lord that day. And his life completely changed. Now that's Thursday. That's a Thursday, 1 January 1915. Tomorrow's Friday. Guess who comes knocking? That's right. Uh, Everett Delk is coming by, marrying a few, and a couple of Alvin's uh, brothers are coming over. Uh, Harry's one of them. And uh, Alvin, it's time to go to the Blind Tigers and kick back a little bit and blow, blow off some steam. Alvin's like, I really wanted to go because it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but he remembered that he just accepted the Lord the day before. He's like, no, no, I'm a Christian. Now, hey, that's okay. We're Christians. See, well, they were Sunday Christians. He's trying to be a real Christian. <laughs> and so Alvin's like, no, I'm not going. And so, wow, because that was really hard. And the next week they come around again. Alvin said, I, it was tempting. I, I so wanted to go again. It was a lot of fun. But he noticed something, he said no again. He goes, every time I, I turn the temptation, temptation down, the easier it got to say no to it. It's like, wow. And he's gonna say later on in, in his diary, you know, all the trials and temptations I've done went through were to build my character. I think this is the most important part of the York story and why you should care about the York story because this tells you the formula, the secret, of how to be a man or woman of honor. So when that day comes and calls you to noble action, you'll, you'll know what to do because you've already made it a habit. By daily trying, now look, nobody's perfect. Alvin clearly was not perfect and none of us are. And when you make a mistake, you pick yourself up out of that mud, learn from it and try not to do that again. And so, you know, Alvin every, every weekend by turning down the hard temptation to going down to the blind tigers up the road here and kicking back with his friends, 
he was slowly building his moral character. I call it building your character muscle. He was becoming brave and courageous in his heart to say no to peer pressure, to his friends, to the temptation, to the desire for, for whiskey and for, and for women. I mean, all, all the stuff that most guys are tempted with. And uh, slowly he's becoming a man of honor. Within a year of him accepting the Lord, he's now going to be the second elder of his church, assistant pastor. Bet from a good-for-nothing drunk, you'll never amount to anything, to the assistant pastor filling in for uh, Pastor Pyle when Pyle's not available to preach. He's also teaching Sunday school. He's, he's teaching choir to the young kids afterwards to give them something to do, something, you know, something uh, wholesome to do. And wow, this is a huge change in this young man's life. And so Alvin's thinking by now, maybe Francis, Francis Asbury Williams will, will let me see Gracie a bit, but F.A. Uh, Williams isn't so sure. He's kind of wondering, you know, I got to make sure this is a genuine conversion before I let you be alone with my daughter. So he's a bit suspicious, but things are looking great for Alvin York. But the world turns upside down in April 1917 because the United States finally enters the war. Because the war has been going on since 1914. And before long, a draft card comes here with Alvin York's name on it. He's in the army. Now, this is a big moral dilemma, even for many Christians to today. You know, how do you overcome the whole idea of, of killing your fellow man? And so this is a big moral dilemma. And when he reads the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, he doesn't go to the Hebrew and says, you know, thou shalt not murder, really. It's like, it's, thou shalt not kill for any reason whatsoever another person. So what do you do? And so he, Alvin fills out this card. This, this is his actual draft card. It's available at the National Archives in Atlanta, Georgia. And he fills out the bottom block there. And, you know, reason that, that for, he applies for a, a conscience of objection. So why don't you want to fight? And York says, he just simply says in there, yes, don't want to fight. Okay, the draft board gets that, and it's like, okay, that's not a good enough reason. So, of course, Alvin has to go to Jamestown up the road here and explain to the draft board his, his, his Christian views. And the board starts asking, well, you're, you're a member of the Church of Christ and Christian Union. Uh, what, what's your doctrine? Oh, it's the Bible. It's a, it's a good back-to-Bible church. And the draft board is like, well, do you have any church doctrine that, that makes you like a Mennonite or an Amish sort of person you know, that, that delineates church doctrine outside the Bible? It's like, nope, that's all we need. And the draft board says, well, there's a lot of Christians out there that think you can fight for your country, so you're going in. Oh, man. This is a hard time. This was, you know, the movie kind of glosses over it a bit. This is a hard time. Alvin York is praying to God. He's sure God's going to deliver him from military service because it's, it's against the Bible. And he's going. He has to report to Camp Gordon, Georgia. That's Fort Gordon today. And there's a lot of confusion. What do I do? And he's praying and praying. He's, he decides when he gets to camp, he's going to lay low and uh, just do whatever the uh, officers tell him. But, well, that makes him stand out. We actually have a, a soldier in the army here that does everything we tell him to do, and he does it really well and better than everyone else. And the officers, his company commander is Captain Danforth, and his, his battalion commander is Major Buxton. They're like, we want to make you a corporal. And they bring him in the office, want to promote him from private to corporal. And he's like, I don't even want to be in this army. Don't promote me. And they're like, what? <laughs> this is not good. What's wrong with you? And so Alvin York lays out his, his concerns about fighting for his country to Captain Danforth and Major Buxton. And Major Buxton, as you see in the movie, invites him to his office and says, Alvin, and this is, Alvin's a bit intimidated. He has, he has two officers talking to him. And he thinks maybe they're going to push him around. Maybe He doesn't know what to expect. Maybe yell. Just no idea. And, and Major Buxton, his battalion commander, puts him immediately at ease. Because Alvin, have a seat. We're going to talk not as, not as officer to soldier, but as Christian to Christian. As Christian brothers. Alvin's like, wow, this is fantastic. And all they did, now, unlike the movie, the movie they, they throw in some American history. That, that wasn't there. All they did in that meeting between Captain Danforth, Major Buxton, and uh, Private York was talk through the Bible. And York, why, don't, why do you believe you can't fight for your country? And York would crack open the Bible verses for that. And then, you know, Major Buxton or Captain Danforth would counter back and forth. And, and it's, it's interesting. York said, I had such a great feeling in that, move, in, in that meeting in, in the office there with the officers. There was no screaming and yelling. It was just Christians having a good discussion about God's word. But they're at an impasse. York is not budged. He knows what he's believed. He's been studying the Bible for the past couple of years, and that's it. 
So what happens? What breaks the impasse? Finally, Captain Danforth stands up and reads from Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet book, Ezekiel 33. And it's the first seven verses in Ezekiel 33. It's, it's the verses on the watchman on the wall. Basically, in this scripture that Danforth reads to York, uh, it's not, you know, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and God's the things of God's, like you see in the movie. That, that's too simple. The watchman on the wall, God says, I appoint you, my people, in this case, brothers and sisters in the Lord, you're watchman on the wall, and if you don't do your duty and warn my people of the approaching enemy, of the impending danger, it will be as if you kill them. Their blood will be on your hands, it says in the King James Version. And York's like, he stands up and says, okay, I'm satisfied. I believe I can serve in the army. I'm not so sure I could kill for my country, but I'm willing to die for my country. What do you do? The, the officers, Danforth and Buxton, are like, okay, we're still going to promote you because you're a really good soldier. You're the best shot in the entire division, by the way. He's teaching all of uh, some of my ancestors, the, the Italians and all the other guys off the boat how to shoot. You know, you, Alvin York was at the rifle range with them. He was scared for his life because there's Italian, Greeks, and Eastern Europeans never picked up a rifle before because they were shooting everything except the targets. So your, Alvin York is the man to go to for, mark, for sharpshooter training. And he's teaching these Greeks and Italians and others how to shoot straight, and it's... They're coming along the thanks to him. So Alvin is promoted to corporal. He's given a 10-day pass to come home to, to pray about this situation. And he comes up here right on the mountain over here, and he prays, and God gives him the peace that surpasses all understanding from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. You know, it's, it says in, in, in there, and this is what happened to York. That's a miracle. Because be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what's going to happen? So Alvin York is letting his, his concerns, his anxiety be known to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understandings will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He comes off that mountain with a, with a peace and an assurance from God he's going to come back alive. And he comes home and he tells his mom, Mary, I'm going into the army. I'm not so sure about this killing business, but I, I, I'm going to go do my duty and I'm coming home. It's like, whoa, okay. He reports back to duty just in time for the division, 82nd Division. It's 82nd Airborne today. He gets back to Camp Gordon in time for the parade where uh, Mrs. Gordon herself, her, her husband, uh, General Gordon, was a great Confederate war general from Georgia, a good man of honor too, by the way. So anyway, York shows up in time. The division has a parade. They get on to transportation, you know, trains to New York City and to Boston and Hoboken, New Jersey, and begin their journey to France. But, you know, I wonder, you know, clearly Doug Mastriano will never be the next Alvin York. I can't hit the side of a barn. You'd be surprised how bad I shoot. Sir, you'd be appalled. <laughs> but I wonder if some of us, you know, okay, so God has a specific role in place for each of us. I wonder if some of us could be the next Buxton and Danforth. I wonder of those grandchildren or children out there or people we're at school with together or work with side by side could be the next York or Chamberlain or Rieger. I wonder, you know, we have a big influence. And by living as men, men and women of honor, how we could change people's lives. And maybe they'll be the ones that rise up to save this nation in its hour of need. I just wonder. That's why this story should marry, matter to you. You know, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, I spoke about him before, uh, the great Civil War colonel during the Battle of Gettysburg on 2nd July, 1863, Battle of Little Round Top, fighting to save the nation. And uh, he said, War makes good men better and bad men worse. Crises in our lives, financial strife, financial issues, health issues, trouble with the kids, marital problems, the real you comes out in a, in a, in a crisis. It need not be a war. And how you predetermine how you're going to respond in that crisis is how you, how you live your life. The true you comes out. And that's why I speak about building your moral character. You know, York turning down a temptation to going up to ball rock and static down the road here, that was not easy for him. But that was his path to becoming a man of hero, a man of courage, and a brave man in his heart. So what we see on that day, on 8 October 1918, was merely an outward manifestation of the man he'd already, he'd already become. And that's why I ask people to think about that. Try to do the right thing. Try to turn away from temptation. And you'll build that your, your moral character muscle. You become a hero and brave person in your heart. So when you're faced with, with that situation where all hope is lost, you'll know what to do because it's in your nature. Chamberlain goes on to say no one suddenly becomes different from their habit or thought. That's true. So that's why we need to every day exercise our character muscle. So let's press on here. 
So the Americas, that, that's my uh, great-grandpa there in, in the U.S. Army chasing Pancho Villa down in Mexico way. But we go from 200,000 soldiers to 4 million soldiers in two years. I wonder what the quality of those soldiers were going into the Argonne Forest in, in 1918, facing battle-hardened, trained and skilled German defenders. We were in a bad situation. The United States strategy in 1914 to 1917 was to stay out of the war. And even though more than 200 Americans had died by German U-boat sinkings, uh, President Woodrow Wilson thought to do anything to prepare the nation for war was a provocation and therefore did nothing. And who's gonna pay the price for a foolish presidential strategy? People like you and me or our children. And so we're gonna throw sometimes raw recruits into German machine guns. I, I have accounts of German officers fighting in the Meuse-Argonne region, feeling bad they're killing so many Americans. The Americans are lining up attacking old style, 1914 style, into German machine guns. And there's piles and piles of our dead forebears stacked in front of German machine guns. That's the folly of having bad pres uh, presidential leadership like Woodrow Wilson leading the country astray. And Woodrow Wilson paid no price for that blood. It was the average American. And, and to make matters worse, our experience is chasing Indians or, or fighting on the frontier, and so we're gonna well, it doesn't help, because General Pershing rejects the advice from the British and French to help us prepare for modern war, because, you know, we're Americans, we, we don't need your help. I'll get to that in a second. Just to put it in perspective here, each man here represents the size of an army of a country. So over here we have Russia, the big tall guy with almost six million soldiers, the Germans with four million. This is 1914, before the war began for anybody. Go all the way down, that little guy on the corner there is Belgium, at 220 soldiers. 220,000 soldiers, the United States would be on the other side of little Belgium guy. That's what we're going to go to, f to war with in 1917. That's a bad way to be. So we, we lack everything. The arsenal of democracy in World War I is the French. We're going to need to borrow and beg and steal helmets, weapons, uh, rifles, machine guns. No American tanks will fight in combat. It will be French tanks that we're driving. General Patton, his, his brigade of tanks are French Renault tanks. I mean, this, this is a bad way to be as, an, as a country, a powerful country. No American airplanes will make it into the fight. We'll use French and British airplanes and French and British engines to fight. It's a cold start. And think about the soldiers now. How prepared are they to go? How prepared are the officers and, and NCOs training them in modern warfare? Not at all. Uh, to make matters worse, General Pershing believes that the American with a bayonet and rifle could win the war. So we don't need any French or British help because the reason why we're stuck in trench warfare on the Western Front is because you French and British guys don't know how to fight. Uh, the French uh, try to warn us about that. The French say to Pershing, yeah, we tried that in 1914. We lost 200,000 men in a couple weeks. Bad idea. And uh, no, we're Americans. We're better than you. Out of frustration, the French premier, he'd be known as president today, French premier uh, George Clem George's Clemens so said, if the Americans refuse to learn from the French, then the Germans will teach them. That's a heck of a way to learn. And the Germans will teach us very well. Because of that, we'll have 20-some thousand casualties a week. Could you imagine that? Uh, here's a quote from one of uh, York's uh, officers. I call it to build an army. And what this, uh, this officer here, Cap Lieutenant Jones, says, foreign instructors, so French and British instructors arrived to teach us how to fight the war. The French swore by the hand grenade and the Shoshat light machine gun. The British swore by the bayonet. And we swore by, well, anyway, we swore and worked a little bit harder. So we didn't know what we were doing. Who do you believe? What's the right way to do this? Okay, here's the situation on the Western Front. In 1918 is a rough year. A hundred years ago last week, the Bolsheviks took over Russia. Russia's out of the war. Now you have a million extra German soldiers to fight on the Western Front. Those million German soldiers, they train over the winter time, early 1918, and then head towards France. And uh, the Germans launched five attacks that break the French and British lines. It looks like we're going to lose. It looks like we're going to speak German in the future. But just in the nick of time, finally enough Americans show up to make a difference, and the Allies hold. And by July of 1918, the, the first Supreme Allied commander, his name is Ferdinand Foch, second Supreme Allied commander is Eisenhower, World War II. Ferdinand Foch says it's time to f f take the fight to the enemy, and he works out this plan where this is going to affect now the Americans, and this is now where we get into the York story. You can see the, the, the five attacks that Fernand Foch is going to uh, order across the front. The bottom arrow is going to kick off with 600,000 Americans initially, 
In the end, it's going to be 1.2 million Americans. This is America's largest ever battle campaign. 1.2 million Americans, bigger than, than Bulge, Normandy, Market Garden, Okinawa, 1.2 million Americans, but we forgot about it. It's too bad. There's a lot of lessons there. Americans will kick off the attack there. That's important because if the Americans succeed, they're going to cut a German rail line that comes out. There's only three German rail lines coming out of Germany. And if the Americans cut that line by Sedan, it looks like Sedan, Sedan, it's on the map there, we could cut off the German army. So the American attack is the most dangerous, and because of that, Foch sees that the American army is going to be the focus of the Germans. The Germans will be forced to take their 24 reserve divisions to try to stop us, and it works just like that. The Americans absorb the brunt of the German strategic reserves, opening the way for the British and the Canadians and the French and the Belgians up north. So that's called the Meuse-Argonne Offensive down at the bottom there. There's a picture of a German machine gun crew. Alvin York's going to face such a crew on 8 October 1918 and lose some of his dearest friends from one of those. You can see on the map there, Chateau Chéry is uh, right off of the uh, French autostrada. It's three hours east of Paris on their autobahn, on their highway. That's zooming in here a bit. Okay, here's the situation now. I'm going to actually kick you a week before the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. The, the American attack kicks off on 26 September 1918. Initially, there's great success, but the Germans recover, and it's now a bloodbath, and we're starting to find ourselves in, in a stalemate. Uh, if you look at the map there, you'll see something interesting in the lower left-hand corner. You'll see a red circle behind the German lines. That's 694 Americans trapped behind German lines. On the 2nd of October, 1918, there's going to be a Franco-American attack to try, to try to break through the Argonne Forest. All the French and Americans are stopped except, except 694 Americans who break through. They're going to be roughly a half a mile behind German lines for five days. It's called the Lost Battalion. So what do you do to save them? For five days, the United States Army and the French Army are trying to save these guys, and the Germans aren't letting us through. And we're losing more guys in the attacks trying to save them than are trapped in the pocket there. But it has strategic value. If the Germans could force that battalion of Americans underneath the command of Major Charles Whittlesley to, to surrender, it will be a psychological blow against the American army. Which it's a brand new army, and that's a big deal. So the Germans launch a series of attacks to try to reduce the pocket, but the Americans are holding. To make matters worse, though, for the Americans is that the 77th Liberty Division, mostly out of New York City, uh, the division commander, his name is General Alexander, he, he orders a barrage to, to put a line of fire, at least to protect the Americans from frontal attacks. But that barrage falls short, and 90 Americans are killed or wounded by our own artillery. Oh, my goodness. How does Major Whittlesley let, let the commander know that to stop this? You're killing us. So they have two courier pigeons left, and Major Whittlesley writes a note, gives it to the private to put on the bird's leg, but the bird escapes. He's like, no, we're down to one bird now. The last bird's name is Cher Ami. You can see her over there. And uh, Major Whittlesley puts this message on there. He goes, we are, he tells where we are, where the Lost Battalion is located, and your artillery is dropping directly on us. For God's sake, stop it. And they let Cher Ami go, and Cher Ami is terrified. She's in the middle of a, a, a barrage of artillery, a storm of steel. She doesn't want to fly in this, so she lands on a nearby tree. And Major Whittlesley says to the private who's in charge of the bird, get that bird out of here. And, and the private, poor guy, you know, us officers always giving orders. The, the private's throwing rock and, rocks and sticks at, at Cher Ami, but she's not going nowhere. And then finally, he goes, you better get that bird out of here. So the private gets out of his hole, climbs up there, and shoos her away, and she goes to the next tree. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> finally, he scares her off just in time for an American artillery round to crash right below her, killing three American soldiers. And, and, and she... she Feathers explode, and she whirls to the ground and crashes. I'm like, what do you do? We're done. I have no way to, Major Whittlesley has no way to communicate with headquarters. But after a few minutes, Cher Ami, being the good army bird that she is, she starts, oh, that's what I'm talking about. She starts to stir, starts to flutter, and, and takes off. And she lands at Army headquarters just a few minutes later, although she's missing a leg, thank God it's not the leg with the message on it, has a hole in her breast and missing an eye, she lands and she, she collapses, like stop the barrage, and she saves the day. You can see uh, Cher Ami on display down there at the Smithsonian, in fact, she's there. You know, the, the Army wanted to take care of, of this great hero, so they gave her a citation, 
in retirement, but some people were concerned that it wasn't enough, but it, you know, it was, it was just like bird feed, but hey, she lived off of it, so she was good to go. Okay, so now the lost battalion, we gotta save these guys. So finally, this is the problem with, with an army not ready for war. Finally, four days into this, somebody has the idea, why don't we take the 82nd Division with Alvin York and swing them around the flank of the Germans and hit them from behind? Wow, that's Tactics 101. Our ROTC students that were here earlier today, they, they know as much. That, that's how bad this is. Like, yeah, that's a great idea. Try to hit the enemy in the flank. So 82nd Division moves up with Alvin York, and they, of course, won't get into that now, the rest of the story. But it's focused on saving the lost battalion. That's the purpose of York's attack. And if you can see, you follow that arrow behind uh, Alvin York there in the attack right here, there's a German supply road, and there's only one German supply road that goes north and south. It's called the North-South Road. Pretty original. Got to love the Germans. If you cut that road, you cut off all the supply routes. There's a, there's a little, tr little kitty train on there, DeCauville tr Railroad, the little fun trains carrying supplies. The road is really wide. It's, it's beautiful today even. And uh, you cut that road, all the Germans in the Argonne have to go. So it's like, yes, let's attack, attack behind the Germans, sever that road. That will save the lost battalions. The Germans will retreat and will be squared away. This is the view from, that Alvin York would have had going from the Meuse Valley into the Argonne Forest. You have that nice farm field there, and guess who's on the hills there? Lots of German machine guns ready to say hello to you. And, so, and you see the village of Chatel Chéry there as well. And the plan is to attack through those hills. The tall hill on the right is called Castle Hill. Castle Hill by the Germans. Hill 223 by the Americans, less glamorous. And uh, once you get over Castle Hill now, this is my wife and I are standing on Castle Hill. They're looking into the Argonne, and that's what York's going to see except a lot less hospitable because we don't have anyone shooting at us. The, the Germans figured out that the Americans were gonna try to do this attack to save the lost battalion, and the Germans set up a fire trap, a kill zone. They brought up several, they brought up four regiments, let the Americans into the valley, and then just open up and unleash hell upon them. And that's exactly what happened. The American attack's gonna be stopped dead. That's the kind of terrain you're facing the Argonne. Uh, Argonne forest literally has been there since Noah's days. You can't use that. It's, there's artesian wells bubbling out of the ground. There's rough ravines. But, in, you know, in some ways, it may have looked a little bit like the, some of the hills behind us here. You know, God, God prepared Alvin York for that, that day, going into that place. It's a bit scary. Scary for, you know, some of my relatives there living in a big city in New York and what have you. But this looked like home a little bit, except there's some machine guns in there shooting at you. A little bit different. Okay, here's the key players as, as I get into the story here. Uh, the, the German officer to the left side is Lieutenant Paul Fulmer. He come, he's a lieutenant. He's often referred to in the books as a major. He was a lieutenant, but he was a battalion commander. He had several hundred Germans that he commanded, and he commanded most of the troops in the valley where Alvin York's going to fight. Important figure. Uh, he lived in Chicago before the war, and so he speaks great English. Uh, one of his dearest friends is Fritz Endress. We'll talk about him later on. Uh, in the, cut off, but in the middle is this angry-looking German guy. His name is Max Toma. I call him the Angry Bavarian. He's uh, from outside of Munich. He commands a, a Bavarian company of engineers, a hundred and some men of engineers. They're miners. Not young, but miners. And, you know, during the tr trench warfare days, they, they would dig underneath the, the uh, French lines and blow up the, the French from below. But now they're out of a job because we're out of the trench warfare. So he's now fighting his infantry. And the machine gun commander on the right side of the screen is Lieutenant Paul Lipp from Stuttgart, Germany. He's got a big family. He started off the war as a sergeant, received the battlefield commission. He's a great guy. He's a hilarious character. And uh, that picture of him after he's captured by, uh, by Alvin York says it all. He's just kind of like happy to be alive with that cigar in his mouth. Okay, so here's the lay down, the, the blue arrow and the blue uh, rectangles on there are the American units, of course the red of the German. The Americans attack into the valley in that big fat arrow and the Americans are stopped dead. All hope is lost. Uh, the platoon sergeant, his name is Sergeant Harry Parsons, a vaudeville actor from uh, New York City. He had a heavy New York City uh, Bronx accent. Uh, he ordered York and several other, other of the squad, uh, squad leaders to, to get their men and try to break through the German flank. He, and he pointed towards the south. And so York and 16 other soldiers advanced towards the south. There we go. Okay. 
So I won't use this. If you look at the map there, that big fat arrow, York and 16 others will break through the southern part of the German line. Now look, they're under heavy German fire. Machine gun fire, rifle fire, and artillery fire is smashing into the Americans. It's the single bloodiest day of this regiment in their history, to including their time in, in, in World War II. Any given day in World War II, this is the bloodiest single day. It's awful. And so as York and the 16 other Americans are making their way to the south to, get it, to move around the German, you can see the black arrow where York and the other 16 move. Something interesting happens. The attack kicked off at 6.10 in the morning. Actually, it was supposed to begin at 6 o'clock in the morning with a 10-minute ar American artillery barrage. The artillery barrage never showed up. So the Americans attacked cold right into the Germans. The Germans are like, this is fantastic. But that artillery barrage shows up in the nick of time when York and the 16 other guys needed it. If it's move, it fires when they're moving below the German machine guns on that hill. And those 17 Americans are able to move around because of the providential timing of the delayed and late American artillery barrage. And so underneath the command of acting as Sergeant Early, York and the other Americans move, it takes them about an hour because they're moving slow. It's not very far, but they're trying not to be discovered. Their orders are to try to take out the machine guns in the center of the valley. And you can see they, they attack around, they get through the German lines. They move deep. Uh, there's a couple times where Corporal, uh, Sar Acting Sergeant Early asks everybody, should we, should we attack the Germans now? And York's like, no, we've got to go deeper. They go deeper. And then finally, they finally turn, they, they start moving behind the German lines to make the final push. And they bump into two German soldiers carrying water buckets. These German soldiers see the water buckets, drop them, go running. And the Germans, full of, these two German privates, foolishly run by, right back to headquarters. And the 17 Americans follow them. The 17 Americans surprise about 70 German soldiers. While these two guys are screaming, the Americans are here, you know, because they don't know what's going on. These, this is the lost battalion soldiers. The, the, the Germans call it the American nest, Americaner nest. Did they break through? I mean, they, don't, they have no idea. And so it's shock and awe. 17 Americans suddenly pop up. It looks like a lot more to the Germans. The Germans, to their dying day, especially Paul Fomer says, it wasn't 17, it was 100. Okay. Okay. You decide. But it was 17. So uh, anyway, these 70 Germans surrender because suddenly these Americans are behind them. It's not because they were demoralized or wanted to quit the war. It's, it was just a moment of shock. Whoa, what's going on here? And so the 17 Americans are trying to push these German prisoners into a manageable group, but they're kind of dragging their feet because there's a machine gun on the hill above where the cigar guy, Lieutenant Paul Lipp, is. And Lip, of course, is focused on the Americans, but he notices things are quiet down to his right, and he looks, and he sees Americans with a bunch of German prisoners. And so Lieutenant Lip has the machine gunners move their machine gun into a better position, and they yell down to the uh, prisoners, Runter, get down. Get down, Runter. And not, unfortunately, not one of the Americans there spoke a lick of German. So all 70 Germans hit the deck. They're on the ground in this meadow. 17 Americans are in the open. The German machine gun opens fire and it kills six of the Americans and wounds three. The surviving Americans are piled on, a, on the bodies trying to crawl around all these German prisoners. The Germans are yelling, hey, be careful. Don't, there's, we're just Germans down here. Don't shoot us. And York said, Alvin York said, you never heard such a racket. What do you do? Now, he went into this fight. He just told uh, Mario Muzzi, whose birthday it was, an Italian immigrant guy in his unit, because I, uh, I, I can't kill any Germans from my country but happy birthday. And so Mario's gonna get out with his life, although wounded. And so uh, what do you do? He's now the only non-commissioned officer not dead or wounded. York is now in charge of this unit. He looks around and he sees dead and dying men all around him and he says, I have to do something to stop this. Now what was the trigger for him was that as a conscience of objector serving the United States Army, how popular do you think Alvin York was? If you were a, if you were a soldier serving next to him, would, would you, would, did you think, would you think that he'd have your back? He wasn't popular. So he had, basically he only had one friend in the army and this guy, his name was Corporal Murray Savage. And they clung together. They, they, they are good Christian brothers. They, uh, Savage and York, they kept each other accountable. They tried to avoid the, the, the young mademoiselles and, and the, the, the wine and, and they read the Bible together, prayed together a lot. And, uh, He's dead now. He was cut almost in half by so many bullets hit him. And York, York, York said, I got to stop this. It was not, I'm, I'm convinced it was not rage. I got to stop the killing. And so he, he yells at the other guys, the survivors, you watch after the prisoners. 
and, and stay low, and he runs up the hill towards the fire, towards the machine gun. And he runs up the hill, and it's amazing. What an eye for terrain. Clearly, God directed him. Because he ends up stopping, up, he runs up the hill, and he hits a place where there's, there's two sunken roads that the front, the Germans are using them, but they're old roads from hundreds of years ago, and it's just a natural terrain feature. And there's one lower road and one higher one. The German machine gun is a lower one, and a higher one has German infantry soldiers standing on a trench. It's a, it's a you know, made-up trench. And it's shooting into the Americans in the valley below. York hits the tip of that V, and he starts yelling, he starts asking for them to surrender. <laughs> what? That's why I say it wasn't rage. He wasn't out there, I'm going to kill these guys. No, it's like, i got to stop it. And they weren't listening to him. So he, started, he takes out the German machine gun, about a crew of about five. He kills them. And now the riflemen are starting, well, what's going on? The, the Germans don't really, I don't think they can really hear him. He's going, surrender now, stop shooting. And they won't, and he kills 19 Germans altogether. Now, during the fight, Lieutenant Paul Lipp, who commanded that machine gun, the cigar guy, he went up the hill to get more reinforcements. York, York just finished killing 19 Germans. He looks up the, further up the hill and sees a wave of Germans, I think about 30, coming towards him. And he's thinking, that's a lot of guys. I'm at a disadvantage. I need to get back to my men anyway. So he runs down the hill. As he's running down the hill, he's behind a, a, a platoon of Germans commanded by Lieutenant Fritz Endress, Paul Fomer's best friend. Remember, remember Chicago guy, Paul Fomer? Uh, growing up uh, in, in Württemberg, Germany, him and Fritz Endress were inseparable. Ten years in the army together. So... Uh, Something strange happens. Fritz Endress realizes the machine gun behind him is quiet, so he turns around to look in time to see an American running behind him. And Fritz Endress is like, bayonet attack, follow me. All his men are facing forward, and suddenly, okay, bayonet attack, no problem, thinking they're going to go that way towards the Americans, but the boss runs backwards, the wrong direction, behind German line. Like, okay, we'll follow him. York, Alvin York turns around and realizes he's being chased by Germans, only one of whom really has eye contact, Fritz Endress. The other guy's like, well, why are we going this way? And so uh, Alvin York, uh, he's down by, back with his men. He slides down on his side. He puts down his rifle, pulls out his Colt 45 pistol, and starts picking off the Germans from back to front. That, that old trick he learned hunting turkeys, just like he's seeing in the movie. And so that prevented the, the lead Germans from realizing they're being massacred. And the, the last guy to fall is Fritz Endress, the, the officer leading the attack. And based off of where we found the artifacts, he was only six feet away from York. Boom! in his abdomens, 45 bullet hitting him in the gut, throws Alvin York back, um, uh, Fritz Endress backward, and he's screaming out in pain for help. Paul Fulmer has been a prisoner now during this whole action, laying down on the ground with the other 70 Germans, and what do I do? And York is now engaging the, the reinforcements on the hill above. Paul Fulmer, fortunately for Alvin, unfortunately for him, he shoots like Doug Mastriano. Fulmer still has his Luger. And he pulls it out, and he's trying to shoot Alvin York from behind, and he's missing every time. Like I said, he shoots like me. Finally, he, he can't take it anymore, and he hears the screams and cries of his best friend, Fritz Endress, and he walks over to, to Alvin cautiously, and about 20, 30 feet away from him, he's yelling. He's got to yell because there's firing going on. He's like, English? And York's like, what? English? And York's like, no, I I'm American. And Palmer's like, good Lord. If you stop shooting, I'll make them surrender. And so Alvin's like, I don't know if this is a trick, but you go ahead and do that. Paul Fulmer pulls out a whistle and blows on it. Paul Lip, the machine gun commander, he hears that on the hill. It's command by whistle. And Paul Lip doesn't know what's going on, but he's, the command is lay down your arms and come down. So Paul Lip orders his 30 soldiers, okay, let's go down. I don't know what's going on, but I know Paul Fulmer. I've been in the army with him for four years. He's a good officer, highly decorated. And they come down and they're captured. Now we have 100 prisoners, eight Americans, behind German lines. What do you do? And just like in the movie, the movie's fairly accurate. It does a, a great job. Alvin York does not have a map. He, he has no idea where he is. You know, I, I've spent more than 100 days in the Argonne there. And there, there was a time, after all that time there, I don't even walk around with maps anymore out there, but there was a time me and my son got lost out there. This was his first day in the Argonne. I was out there 100 days. That's how bad it can be. So Alvin York asked Paul Fulmer, which road should I take to get back to my lines? The high road by the machine gun that he just had crossed or the road behind him where they saw the two guys with the water containers earlier in the fight? And Fulmer's thinking, yes, you take the high road. That will put you underneath a whole bunch of German machine guns. We'll get free. You'll be captured, and the tables will turn. And so he doesn't say all that. He goes, oh, take the high road. And Alvin York... 
He's like, no, we'll take the opposite road. So the Americans and 100 prisoners marched back behind German lines. The mad Bavarian, Max Toma, is now in front of them because they're behind German lines. You have another line of Germans to go through. And the Bavarian guy, he's like, it's too quiet behind me, Max Toma. And he, he orders his guys to mount their bayonets. And he turns around and sees this formation of soldiers, Germans, but some Americans. And Max Toma's like, we got to do a bayonet attack and, and free our, our brothers. But, the, but Alan York brilliantly had placed Lieutenant Lipp, the German machine gun commander, in front of the formation. And Paul Fulmer, the officer in command of the valley, he's got him by the neck and his pistol on his back. And Max Toma, the angry Bavarian, can't get a shot in without killing Germans. And so Alvin says, you better get him to surrender. And so Paul Fulmer is having a conversation in German back and forth with Max Toma. And Fulmer's like, you got to surrender. And Max Toma's very patriotic. Oh, they'll never capture me alive. No, I'm not going to surrender. And then finally, it's very frustrating. And uh, York's, you better get him to surrender quick. And so Fulmer's like, you got to do it. And Max Toma says, I'll only surrender if you, Paul Fulmer, Max Toma says this to him, if you, Max, to uh, if Paul Fulmer, take full responsibility for this. And so Paul Fulmer says, I take responsibility. So that's how we get 132 prisoners. Now, 132 prisoners, eight Americans, does not look like an American formation. On the hill above, Castle Hill, there's a, one of the staff officers, kind of like how, how Gerald and I would be in, in most cases, and the staff officer's Lieutenant Joseph A. Woods. He sees this group of, of, of Germans, and he's like, oh, it's a German counterattack. And he's grabbing all the soldiers he can to, to, to put up a defense. And, but uh, Alvin's like, no, don't shoot, it's me. And they're like, whoa. And then even the brigade commander himself comes and sees that it's Alvin York with 132 prisoners. And uh, what what's the so what? That broke the German line. The 82nd Division was about to be set for defeat. The Germans had a two-pronged counterattack prepared. The bottom counterattack is defeated. The, the northern one will go forward, and the Germans will counterattack in the north part on the top of the map, and they'll capture 100 Americans and throw the Americans out of the valley. But thanks to Alvin York, that second counterattack is, is completely gutted out. And that enables the Americans to push through the supply road and save the day. It, it, calls, it, goes, down, it goes down to one man, though. That's an artist's depiction. Schoonover, that, that piece of art now is back in Tennessee. It's a fairly accurate depiction how I, I imagine it would have been. It was published in the Ladies' Home Journal back in the day when those magazines actually had interesting things to read. <laughs> so the question for you is, is it true or is it false? And we've heard some debate about this. And so uh, we've uh, we launched on a decade-long endeavor to try to find the truth. I was not out in the Argonne to prove the York story, but to see if it was so. And so here's, here was my approach using, of course, primary research in the United States and Germany. We're the first to only use, to, to use research in Germany, amazingly. Uh, terrain analysis, of course, looking at the terrain, how soldiers will look at the terrain. Uh, unit templating, you know, where would the units deploy on this terrain by German doctrine. Uh, archaeology, and then forensic analysis. So a lot of art, but you get down to the analysis forensically, and that's science. So the multidisciplinary approach, and our goal was, was to, to either prove it happened or, or not, or what, any, what are the wrinkles in the story. You can see some of the forensic pictures in there taken by Dr. Doug Scott, University of Nebraska. He did the uh, groundbreaking research in the 80s with National Geographic at Little Bighorn. And uh, yeah, he, he did the look, and we'll talk more about that in a second. There's the archives that we hit in the States and in Europe. And then here's just some of the, the vital pieces of information. You'll see a picture in the lower right-hand corner taken by a photographer that was out there with Alvin York on 1, 1 February 1919 during the investigation and said, hey, I took this picture one and a half kilometers northwest of Chateau Chery. Okay, great. Uh, up, upper right-hand corner is an affidavit from the only American officer to cross that spot on that day within minutes of, of Alvin York's action. And he describes where it happens, where it, where it occurred. Matches that picture, by the way. Uh, here's a German overlay, the German disposition, and then a German study, and they said X is where this happened. It, the site was never lost to history. It's just us historians lost, lost our grasp of the facts, I think. It was... We're, with this information, we're able to narrow down the spot to a 300 by 300 square foot area. That's still a lot of ground to cover with metal detectors. Uh, in the end, we're going to recover more than 8,000 artifacts. There was no cross-contamination. There was no, there, no other action or battle fought here at any time from the Roman period to World War II. 
It's just a York fight, just a York action. This, this is uh, about six miles away from the front line where the lines were static and back and forth trench warfare. It's, it's, it's not even part of that. And that's a view of some of the artifacts we recovered, uh, evidence of the, the, Prussian, the, the Prussian regiment that was there, the, the two Württemberg regiments that were there. Uh, on that V, at the, at the tip of the two sunken roads, the German Jews, uh, this is what we recovered. 46 rounds. Alvin uh, was asked by his, uh, Major Buxton was his commander uh, earlier in the war. He had a new battalion commander. Buxton was, was so, so good they made him uh, the division adjutant general. And so uh, he did some of the interviews with Alvin York after the battle and said, well, how many bullets you fire? And York said, basically three clips uh, from my uh, 45 sidearm and almost all the bullets from my front pouches for my, for my rifle. That'd be 50 bullets. We found 46 cartridges. And on the right side, you'll see 24 cartridges from uh, Colt, automat Colt, Colt 45 automatic pistols. I say pistols, plural. You'll see why in a second. This is what Dr. Doug Scott did forensically. He looked at it. And he said, as far as the rifle casings go, we nailed it. This, this, these are York's artifacts. It did happen. You know, some of the problems you have is trying to identify a German machine gun position because the, the, the Germans used cloth belts in those days. And by 90, it was 90 years on then, the cloth would be rotten away. But we found some of the links the feeder links that were in between the cloth, they fused themselves to the bullets. And that, that is the exact machine gun that York, Alvin York charged on 8 October 1918, that position. We found about 500 cartridges and, uh, and about 50 live ones there. Clearly, it was a machine gun, not a rifle. It was the same caliber they used in the rifles as well. But we had the cloth belt pieces. Uh, I'm gonna, there's a lot to cover. I'm going to hit this fast and furious here to wrap it up. Uh, the most important find, I'm often asked this, so I just put it on the slide. The most important discovery was what you see in the screen here. It was the full effects of a soldier missing in action. His name is Private Wilhelm Herr. He's a, a machine gunner private from outside of Stuttgart, Germany, Bachtung on Steinbach. We found everything that belonged to him, all his underwear buttons, uh, every piece of equipment that he was carrying, even his complete dog tag. <clears throat> we found everything except his, his bones. <clears throat> That's his dog tag, as we found it about two inches into the ground in the Argonne. Why should you care about that? He was one of the machine gunners engaging Alvin York. So this isn't subjective, this is an interpretive analysis. This, this is hard evidence here. So that, that just adds to the ballistics. Uh, what happened to those artifacts? We had a ceremony on 1 May uh, 2009 where we returned the effects to, his, uh, to the town and the family outside of Stuttgart. It was a classy event, and, and that's actually handing it over to the family members. <clears throat> The most intriguing find is exactly what you see here. What Dr. Doug Scott says about the 24 Colt 45 cartridges we recovered. Basically, Dr. Doug Scott says, these 24 casings you recovered represent two Colt pistols. And if, check this out. You zoom in on, you can see those cartridges on the slide there. And you see the drag on the one on the left? That, 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 this, this weapon on the left side here, that soldier did not take very good care of his weapon. Because that's a firing pin. That's a firing pin. And you can see where it's dragging a little bit, well, quite a bit, actually, on the guy on the left there. So what do you do? 24 Colt 45 uh, automatic pistol cartridges, and Dr. Doug Scott says it's two people. Is that a problem? Absolutely not. Uh, during the Army, the Army did three investigations on this. First for the Distinguished Service Cross that Alvin received in November, and then uh, two follow-ups in January and February. And there was a soldier, the light machine gunner, his name was Private um, Percy Beardsley, sorry, from upstate New York, outside of Rochester. And he was the, the, the machine gunner. He carried a French machine gun called the Chauchat. The problem with the Chauchat, or show show as the Americans called it, was it, it had an open magazine, which meant dirt and garbage got in there, and you fire a couple rounds, and it would jam. So the soldiers could not rely upon that, so they equipped all the machine gunners with a sidearm. He also had a Colt 45 pistol. And in his affidavits, he said he fired his, his 45, his sidearm, his pistol, in support of Alvin York against the bayonet attack. Wow. This doesn't take away from the action at all. Alvin just did, did not know that he had good help that day. And uh, we're pushing forward a proposal right now with the United States Army. They, they contacted me a week and a half ago. I'm like, we need to get this guy a silver star. I think this is a win-win for the York story, because we, we bring 
this guy's heroism that was overlooked by the army back to life, but also he draw attention back to the York story to the next generation. And what a better year to do that than next year, the centennial, 100 year anniversary. So that is fantastic. Uh, th this is, you could check this out. That's a picture of Private Piercy Beardsley in a lower left hand corner. You know, he, he was just a good guy. He's a farmer. He didn't care. He didn't get a medal or recognition. He did his duty. He went home. He, he put in his sworn statements, two or three sworn statements that he t talks about it, but I don't need anything else. I'm glad to be home. But if you look at the picture there, there's two patterns of Colt 45 rounds. You'll see on the right side, the flags mark 15 cartridges we recovered and nine against a German bayonet attack. Right next to him was what Private Beers, Piercy Beardsley probably shooting over York to get at the Americans. But obviously when, when you're in a tight situation like that, you're focused on your own problem, these charging Germans. And I believe Alvin York had no idea he had good help that day. So that's fantastic. Uh, the most troubling find, the most somber find is this one here. Uh, this German command field whistle, complete with cork and everything, and that was what we, we recovered six feet away from York's cartridges. And that belonged to Lieutenant Fritz Endress. And the last time he blew that was ordering his bayonet attack, just minutes, moments before he's going to be shot and then die. Uh, his fa uh, having pictures of the, of, these, of the Germans has been really hard, but uh, German, the Germans' ancestors, descendants of uh, Fritz Endress contacted me and sent me a picture of him. It's, it's good to see him. He died trying to save the life of his friend Paul Fulmer. York did what he did to try to save the life of his friends because his best friend was just killed, Murray Savage. You see this connection here? Oftentimes, you know, in war, soldiers tend to fight for each other, for their friends, for their colleagues. Uh, the apple pie and the other stuff really doesn't come out. So to preserve this for all future generations, uh, we received a... This was not easy, as you can imagine, but the French gave us permission to cut a trail in the Argonne Forest. And the trail from, from the marker where, where, that Gerald de dedicated in 1988, was it? So the, the marker downtown, there's a, there's a marker in Chateau Chery that's, that's dedicated to Alvin York in the center of town. If you walk from there, the entire trail, it's, it's about five miles, uh, sorry, three miles total. But if you're a little bit lazy like me, you drive the, towards the edge of town, so you follow this path here through the Argonne. We have nine signs in German, French, and English. You decide on the language, and uh, you, you don't need me there to tell you the York story. And we describe the York story in, the, in detail, what happened. Uh, at the, towards the end of the trail, near the last group of signs at the top of the screen, we have uh, two monuments. One monument is in Alvin York's own words in German, French, and English, of what happened that day on 8 October 1918. And then off to the side, adjacent to it, and of course, uh, Gerald and Debbie and, and, your, and your dad were there with us to dedicate that in 2008, is the names of all 17 Americans who fought. Everyone mattered. Everyone played a part. And no one's forgotten. Piercy Beardsley, he's on there, as well as Murray Savage. This is uh, some pictures from uh, my son's Eagle Scout project there. So, you know, I've been a scouter for about 30 years. I'm an Eagle Scout too, and I'm... Rebbe and I are, and Josiah said, hey, I want to go to France and do the, art, the Sergeant York Trail as my project. We're living in Canada at the time. We're like, that's a bad idea. That's going to be really hard. He's like, Dad, I grew up in the Argonne. I'm going to do it there. And so he re rerouted an artesian well. I mean, that was a mess. That was fun. Uh, hand laid, uh, you can see Rebbe in, on the picture there, my wife on the left. Hand laid 30 tons of gravel with a wheelbarrow in the Argonne. That was brutal. Everyone, everyone out there is like, you'll never get this project done. He got it done. And that was brutal. That, that was the last load of rock we were dropping there. That was a big deal. <laughs> and you could walk where York walked. I mean, it's fantastic. Every day, there's people out there walking a the trail and, and, and learning about this hero from Pall Mall, Tennessee, and how he changed the course of the war. You know, the Germans had planned on using the Argonne Forest as a fortress over the winter of 1918 to drag the war out. But thanks to his action, that was de deprived of the Germans, and you could say that the war ended earlier because of him, of, of a guy that was considered a good-for-nothing drunk that never mouthed anything like that, uneducated guy in the, in the eyes of the world. But look what he did. You know, 1 Corinthians 127 rings true. God uses the foolish to confound the wise and the weak to confound the strong. I'm going to wrap this up here. That's the Monument Park, the two markers. Uh, this was like the biggest event in France since World War II, I think. That's dedicating the monuments in the Argonne Forest. You can see some, some great York family members there dedicating the monument, unveiling the monument. 
Uh, the French estimated it was between eight and 900 people that attended these ceremonies in 2009. That's with the mayor to the right side of the screen. Great guy, great supporter of our work. There's Gerald giving in, uh, the, the remarks downtown in, in the village outside of the York site. I'm almost done here. Gives you a feel for the crowd we had there. It was fantastic. And, what a, and this is the difference. Who would have known? I bet you uh, in 1917, Alvin York could never in his wildest imaginations or dreams that something like, like this would be held in his honor in France. Are you kidding me? And let's wrap this up here. I'm going to say this again how a life can make a difference. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain said we ought to work on our character muscle, try to do the right thing every day. And so when that moment comes that calls us noble action, we'll be able to be like York or like Chamberlain. We know not of the future and cannot plan for it much, but we can hold our bodies so pure and high, we may cherish such thoughts and such ideals and dream such dreams of, of lofty purpose. Why should I do that? So that you can know and determine what manner of men or women you will be whenever and wherever that hour strikes that calls you to noble action. This predestination God has given us in charge, no one becomes suddenly different from their habit and thought. That's how the, the York story matters to you. You know, here's, here's uh, I'd say one of the favorite scriptures for people like York and, and myself. You know, God uses us, whether we're foolish or weak in the eyes of the world, to change the course of history. That could be you. Don't believe the lies. You can make a difference. But clearly, the, the, the critical moment for Alvin York was 1 January 1915. Had he not gone forward that day and accepted the Lord, this wouldn't have happened. I'm convinced this would not have happened. This here shaped this, this young man into a man of honor, courage, and bravery. And it's because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ he's able to do this action. It gave him the confidence, the ability, and strength to overcome the, the moral obstacles in his way and also the physical obstacles in his way, in this case, a German army. More information on our website, sergeantyorkdiscovery.com. And let's wrap this up here. You know what? What you do in life matters. It echoes across the generations and into eternity. Thank you for, for being here. Go out there and make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, for, for being here, you and your wife. We enjoyed having you. Uh, Doug, uh, this book, uh, like I said, excellent book. Uh, when he, he interviewed some of the family, uh, he actually sent us a draft when he first wrote the book and said, look this over and see what you think. Um, the, all of us that looked at it said, this is great. You've got stuff in here that from the German archives that support the story, which is amazing. Uh, Doug will be available in the back and uh, to do a book signing if, uh, if you have one of his books or going to get one of his books out at the foundation uh, table. But thank you very much for, for coming, and we hope you enjoy the, the rest of the weekend. Thank you.